Hello and welcome to another in our series of methods of regression analysis. Today we're going to do a relatively advanced topic, partial least squares. This is an extension of principal components regression. So hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at some principal components regression. We're going to take a look at our PTSD data set that we looked at in ridge regression and principal components. I've added to this data set a log of PTSD. The PTSD is a rather skewed variable. I also will use this later on in the video, added a train of variable which is going to put eight of the observations into a test data set and 56 of the 64 observations into a training data set. We'll see that in a few minutes. So we're going to start off with looking at these data from a linear model perspective. Just a regular regression model of log PTSD against these other 10 regressor variables. Now we see many of these variables are in fact not significant, but what I wanted to look at here was simply overall what's the R squared for all 10 regressors against this log of PTSD. And we could also plot the fitted values against their response variables. Common thing to do in a multi-regression analysis. We see there's a fair amount of scatter still left over from these data. These are pretty noisy data. But we have a 30% R squared. So there's some things going on here. We can see some of the regressors look like they may have some uh, utility maybe once we actually did some subsetting of those variables. But an alternative to subsetting the individual regressors is to map into other linear subspaces of them like we might do with principal components or in this case partially squares. Partially squares is optimizing for actually predicting against a response variable. So the model that we look at in partially squares, the syntax looks very similar. Now you do need to install the PLS package, and then you will have this command for PLSR, which again looks very similar to what we're doing in a linear model. Now you definitely want to include the data option when you are uh, performing a par uh, partially squares because this, the functions that come with the package oftentimes need to refer to the original data set so that it needs to be carried with the object. And there's always some sort of a validation procedure that goes with the algorithms associated with partially squares. We're going to use standard cross-validation by default. It puts this into 10 different bins. And we have 10 individual regressive variables. We're going to compute all 10 of the components. Now that didn't spit out anything yet. Let's take a look at the summary of that analysis. So the summary of a partial least squares tells us the percentage of variance explained in our log variable. Remember that when you're reading up on partial least squares you're mapping a linear combination of your x variables and then using that to optimize predicting against your y variable, in this case our log PTSD. What we're saying is that first component, whatever it is, it's got several different, it's got all seven of the variables, or all ten of the variables rather, loading on it in some way, accounts for 18 percent of the log PTSD variability. But notice when we get to all ten of the components in there, once again we have 30.48%, which is exactly the same R squared we had with all 10 of them. Just like in principal components, if you put in all 10 of your regressor components, regardless of how you do that mapping, it still covers all of the regressor space, so ultimately you're still going to have that same 10-dimensional space predicting your response variable. You're going to get the exact same R squared. What's different is when you're looking at normal multiple regression, you're removing individual regressors in those spaces and they're themselves often correlated. And there's maybe a linear combination of them that works better. In principal components regression and partially squares, we're finding 
orthogonal subspaces that we can put hopefully a small number of those subspaces so we have a small dimensional subset of that 10 dimensional original regressor space but it's not the individual regressors themselves it's some combination of all 10 of them that's still a lower dimensional space now if we look at this it looks like it's going the 18 percent nearly 19 percent of the variability in log PTSD is explained by that first component of the partial least squares 22 percent with two components 24 percent it's actually kind of going up rather slowly for partial least squares but it does by the time we get to six seven components we're nearly 30 percent we can see there's almost nothing gained in the 8, 9, 10. I mentioned that this seems to be going up slowly. That's because I know the next answer, and that is, like in principal components analysis, we need to take into account whether we're dealing with the rescaled data or not. In principal components analysis, we talked about doing the eigenspace of the covariance matrix versus the correlation matrix. We have a very similar problem here. And what I didn't do with these data is I didn't standardize those regressor variables over two, over three, over five, bond, posit, leg, they all have different scales. And in fact, that can make a big difference in our partially squares. So let's take a look at that. I've created a data set that is just the scale of that. It's so using the scale function in R. This PTSD standard data set is all of these variables are standardized. As it turns out, you don't actually have to standardize the uh, regressor variable, or the response variable, rather. So the model I'm building here is the log PTSD in its original scaling, but over 2, over 3, over 5, and so forth, have been rescaled to mean 0, standard deviation of 1. Otherwise, it's the same model we had up there. Now, let's take a look at the summary of that model. And here we see that with the first component, 24% of the variable in a response variable, as opposed to 18 without rescaling it. So again, you get a different answer if you have rescaled your regressor variables. Let me show you. So here in the original male PTSD data, the mean of over 2, for example, is 2.987. Let me just go ahead and show you. In the PTSD standard, all the means are 0, and you'll, you would also find the standard deviations are 1, just to demonstrate that to you. Okay, so we want to take a look at that. Let's do another comparison of those. Another nice thing to look at is, you know, how many components do we need? So you can look at the mean squared error of prediction with the number of components. This is a nice function that is built into the partial least squares package. And that's what it looks like if we did not standardize our regressors. And this is what that plot would look like if we did. It's a very different looking plot. We just get different answers if you standardize versus not. Now in the chemometrics field, where a lot of partially squares gets done, you often have hundreds of variables that come off of a microarray or spectrometer or something like that, that all have the same scale. They're not standardized to mean zero standard deviation one, but they all have the same scale, and there's no reason to rescale them in that case. And that's why oftentimes the default in partially squares, because that this analysis method gets used a lot in chemometrics, we, we tend to see that be the default. So, at any rate, two components. If, if we are using the root mean squared error of prediction from the cross-validation, then two components looks like a good number. And one's not bad. We saw in the summary that one accounted for 24 percent of the variability in our response, two accounts for nearly 29, and then we've leveled off. So it only takes two components for a pretty good model, we, th we think. I mentioned that I had created a uh, training variable. This is just how I'm going to subset it. So one approach that you can take is to use the leave one out method or to have internal cross-validation done on the full data set. Oftentimes people like to do a manual cross-validation when they're working with these models. 
Let's try that here. So let's actually take these eight randomly chosen observations and pull them out of our data set, completely refit the model with the remaining 56 observations. So I've created a training data set with the 56 observations where that uh, value is true, and eight observations are the ones where that's false. Okay. So again, I'm using now my training data set. This is just that standardized data set that I just told you about. Again, I want to deal with my log PTSD. Now I really could use the standardized version of that too. The way I created this data set was simply using scale of the original PTSD data set. But I want to compare my linear model to my partial least squares. And so I want to put everything back into the original units of the response variable. That's why I'm choosing that unstandardized version of that. And all I did there was multiply by the original standard deviation of uh, log PTSD and added its mean back just to put it back up in place. Okay, so we're going to only compute the two component model. So now if we look at the summary of this, we only have the two components uh, in, in the training data set. And my test data set is the observations where this value is false. And those are the eight observations happen to be those observations were chosen at random. This is the predicted values for log PTSD back on its native scale for the eight observations in my one component partial least squares model versus my two component partial least squares model. So in my test data set, I'm just going to go ahead and add that second column to that. So there's my test data set, and this data set, I've already done the linear model, but I'm going to go ahead and show you how I did it anyway. So there's the column I just added. So how did I build that linear model fit? I did the same thing. Uh, there, so this is building my linear model, again, with only the training data set, and then I get the predicted values for the for that linear model, and I added it to the data set. So which one actually has a lower mean squared prediction? Now remember, this model was fit in each case with the training data set, and then I used the training data set to predict onto my test data set. Let's see which one turned out better. Okay, so the sum of the squares from my partial least squares fit, 14.5. Sum of the squares from my linear model fit is 20.6. Now, it won't always be the case that the partial least squares has a lower predicted uh, fit for the cross-validated training data set versus the test data set. In this particular case, it was. My test data set is actually better fit with the partially squares model than it had been with the linear model.